Um, thank you for that. Um, so I want to talk today about the scream as a contradictory textual object and as a figure that marks the junction between multiple possibilities of reading. In horror fictions, both on screen and on the page, the scream is a kind of affective exclamation mark, a climactic release of tension, a kind of horrorgasm. It's also used, particularly in written narratives, as a way of signaling past traumas, of marking a something terrible has happened, often something unspeakable. Where language and narrative break down, the scream enters to mark their impossibility. So for example, um, I just discovered this really cool werewolf story um, by Greya Lespina, who was writing in Weird Tales. It's a female author, um, but her um, gender was kind of um, a mystery for a little while, but she published this story called The Wolf of the Steps in 1919. Um, and it's a, uh, it opens with this, this woman who's in hysterics, just screaming, and this couple finds her. And then slowly, after someone um, speaks a series of words to her that so sort of like magical words, she's able to then tell her story, but at first she's only sort of able to scream. Um, so that's kind of the narrative kickoff. So of course these opening screams, these narrative initiations, also have the effect of, of initiating the narrative tension, and then usually the story then comes out, ending at the point where it began, so at the sort of point of the trauma of the scream. So the scream is not only literal, but in my usage here, it also serves as a marker for what certain horror fictions offer their readers an object that is both an enticement to read and a resistance to interpretation. The sound of a human scream can both unsettle and signify. It can raise hairs on the arms while also carrying a message, alluding to a narrative with both depth and history. In this talk, I examine the coexistence of these two affective slash interpretive possibilities, where the scream serves as a figure for, figure for inscrutability, illegibility, and unintelligibility in horror fiction, in opposition to figures such as occult symbols, literal marks, words, or objects that carry a clear depth of meaning and a possibility for interpretation. The scream not only points to a depth of unspeakable memory, memory history, and psychology, as in Gothic, Gothic literature, but also functions as a signal possessing what Deleuze and Guattari might call an asignifying semiotics that acts laterally rather than through a depth of meaning. I argue that this signal, through its affective destabilization, indexes the slipperiness and insufficiency of both narrative and ontological frameworks, and therefore has the potential to similarly disrupt political configurations. In this vein, I suggest, as a reading practice for horror, a politically oriented occult anti-hermeneutics, or what I call in my dissertation, the title of the dissertation, weird reading, that serves as a supplement or alternative to Gothic hermeneutic reading practices. In the Gothic mode of reading, an artificial, the artificial nature of literature or art becomes the medium through which the unspeakable can be heard. It is only through the mediation of storytelling or the metaphor of the supernatural that readers might grasp some kind of truth of a heretofore undisclosed or undisclosable reality, trauma, or history. By contrast, the weird has a different relationship with mediation, in which the failures of representation, particularly the failures of language, reflect in parallel the failures of human ontological and epistemological schemas. Rather than disclosing a truth through the metaphor of haunting or monstrosity, uh, though this certainly does happen, especially in early weird fiction. So the the werewolf in that in that story I mentioned um, is also so it's it's a literal werewolf, but it's also kind of a um, he's sort of a, a sexual predator as well. So it's definitely talking about sexual trauma as well as this kind of um, horror ontological trauma. Um, <clears throat> so these narratives can tend to conduct conduct speculative thought experiments about what might lie beyond the limits of human knowledge and experience, um, hence why many speculative realists seem obsessed with weird fiction, um, sometimes uncritically, though not always uh, critically. But the Gothic and the weird as ways of reading engage with the, the intersections of politics, politics and aesthetics, uh, but they operate quite differently in terms of how. My formulation suggests that while Gothic hermeneutics engage with allegory and the politics of representation, weird reading emphasizes how aesthetic contradictions and gaps disrupt political ontologies. Um, so I want to move here through a discussion of the scream as an important figure for marking this difference in three ways. First, I offer a brief theory of the scream and how it is represented aesthetically. Second, I discuss the Gothic scream's engagement with race as having at least two different modes of expression. One in the way the Gothic uh, engages with the white woman in peril trope, 
and two, in the way that African-American Gothic, as Maisha Wester explains in her book of the same name, appropriates the conventions of the Gothic in order to scream back at racist representation. Finally, I want to contrast the Gothic's emphasis on representation with the weird's emphasis on failures of representation, in which the, the scream serves as a rupture that refuses to reduce to representation or, or to a legible object. As an example, I'll talk about how both of these ways of reading work in Victor Laval's uh, 2016 novella, The Ballad of Black Tom. When I've talked about this work on the screen to others, people always ask me, oh, are you going to talk about Munch's painting? And for a while, I, I kind of laughed it off or thought it might be sort of a um, half-joking anecdote. But I did a little more digging and thinking, um, and the painting actually is quite apt for what I want to say in many ways. So here's the, the painting. Um, so this is a quote from his diary entry from 1892, the year before he painted this. So he says, I can't look and talk it from the screen. Um, I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun was setting. Suddenly the sky turned blood red. There was blood and tongues of fire above the blue-black fjord in the city, and I sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. So this is um, this is the diary entry. It's been translated a little bit differently, and it's been, he, I guess, um, sort of reiterated it a few times. There's a few different versions of this quote. but um, So in this moment that is described and depicted in the piece, the figure in the painting experiences a kind of existential crisis, but not one about his own life choices or sense of responsibility to the world. Instead, it is the world itself, or a new sense of it, that erupts suddenly into his being. It is notably not the figure that is screaming, but nature, which asserts itself in a new way as pressing in on the figure from the outside. The man, if it is a man, which is a little bit unclear in the painting, but um, since it's referring to a diary entry, it's maybe a representation of Munch himself, um, is experiencing some dislocation between his understanding and experience of the world um, and his, his understanding of the world and his experience of the world. So it's a kind of a moment of ontological horror. Peter Schwenger, in his article on the phenomenology of the scream, analyzes this painting and explains that, quote, Munch has painted the horror more than the scream. <coughs> And, this ex and that this expressionist painting is a representation of the figure's response to that horror. In other words, this is a representation of the scene of horror rather than the phenomenological experience of the scream, which he says responds to something terrifyingly impersonal. By contrast, Schwanger also discusses Francis, Francis Bacon's uh, study after Velasquez's portrait of por Pope Innocent X, uh, including Deleuze's analysis of the painting in which the open mouth is a shadowy abyss through which the body tries to escape, leaving behind the fleshy materiality of meat. Where Deleuze describes the scream as responding to forces from without, uh, Schwenger theorizes that the scream is actually coming, quote, profoundly from within. It is, he says, the attempt for the subject to escape the body's situatedness in time and place, an attempt to escape its own being, with a capital B. Behind the scream, he argues, quote, is a desperate and forceful no, and this negation is not just a desire that things be otherwise in the world. It is, quite unconsciously perhaps, a desire not to be in the world, not to have to see this unendurable scene of horror, not to have to suffer this unendurable pain in one's own body, a body that one cannot escape, a vision that one cannot shut out simply by closing one's eyes." End quote. So I would extend Schringer's claim that the scream presents a desperate and forceful no, to say that it is not just an, the anonymous indifference of being that compels the scream, but the disjunction between that anonymous indifference and the subject's worlding schemas. The moment of horror reveals the fact that one's ontology is, in some sense, both wrong and fragile. Here's a big no. Uh, situated politically, this forceful negation would seem to be a reactionary response. But I argue that it need not be. It may also translate into a politics of refusal. Like the African-American Gothics screaming back, Schwenger's claim resonates with certain strains of queer theory and Afro-pessimism that advocate a kind of nihilistic destruction of these underlying schemas. Calvin Warren's recent book, Ontological Terror, for example, opens by considering the horror that results when one suggests that the phrase Black Lives Matter has no ontological ground because it relies on a Western metaphys metaphysics of the human in which blackness is a fundamental negation of mattering, or that which matters. He says, quote, the function of blackness is to give form to a terrifying formlessness. The puzzle of blackness, then, is that it functions in an anti-black world without being, 
much like nothing functions philosophically without our metaphysical understanding of being an extraordinary mystery. Put differently, metaphysics is obsessed with both blackness and nothing, and the two become synonyms for that which ruptures metaphysical organization and form. So I realize that these nihilistic positions are somewhat contested and controversial, and I'm not trying to situate or make a claim for myself as an Afro-pessimist, but I do think about the ways that horror's affects probe similar ontological quandaries, and that these ontological problems are not apolitical or purely phenomenological, as many white theorists have thought about them in the past. So I'm thinking of um, Eugene Thacker's series on, on the philosophy of horror, the horror of philosophy series, um, where he talks about blackness, but not about blackness, which is, uh, I thought, um, maybe a gap in that, in that series. Um, so the scream does not only erupt out of the subject to say no, it is also an aesthetic object, a signal that affects readers and viewers. So I want to turn now to the gothic and weird representations of the scream to think more about how we read the scream rather than what it means. So, scream, queens, and the gothic, white women in trouble. <laughs> Uh, I want to move quickly through the gothic screen because this territory is pretty well theorized and well covered, um, particularly by Carol Clover's Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Linda Williams on Film Bodies, or Elizabeth Bronfman's Over Her Dead Body, or any number of fem feminist works on the gothic and horror. The concept of the scream queen is essential to the genre of horror. Of course, this is bound up with the cultural narratives of white women simultaneously needing to be protected while also being sexualized, then objectified, put in danger, and then finally often mutilated. It's a neat trick of simultaneously valorizing and punishing whiteness and femininity, respectively, that's been in use for a very, very long time. So I was at the um, Eaton Collection at UC Riverside a couple weeks ago looking at all the old issues of Weird Tales, and I was so surprised that they're sort of like default cover. It's just like white woman in peril um, in some way, usually in you know, like a se sexy kind of negligee thing. Um, and it was funny, and finally in like a, the 19, a 1930 issue, there was a letter from someone in England who was complaining about all the covers, making it look like this, it was gonna be some sort of sexy story. Um, I was like, finally somebody at least noticed that like their covers are really kind of generic and they're all kind of the same. Um, <clears throat> But I don't want to flatten these texts out um, and reduce them to these brief screenshots and imply that they're all doing exactly the same thing because they're decidedly not. Especially in the current golden age of horror, many of these films are brilliant and complex and nuanced, often relying on these tropes in order to perform their own kind of critique or um, to disturb in really, really interesting ways. So I'm thinking especially of films like, it, um, films like It Follows, I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in This House or In the House, um, Hereditary and A Quiet Place were all ones that I think we're really uh, kind of interesting use of this trope in different ways. So I just want to point out that it is, it is though, a repeating pattern of the scream or the need to scream that viewers experience via the white woman's body. <clears throat> so however, despite the fact that popular, the popular horror genre has been dominated by white voices and stories, there are nevertheless increasingly screams back from shadowed places, as Maisha Wester says, in works by authors like Tana Nareev Du, Victor Laval, and Jordan Peele. Um, and then Matt Ruff, the author of Lovecraft Country, I think he's white, but this, um, last I heard Jordan Peele is actually making an HBO uh, series based on this. Um, so it's, a really, it's a cool, cool book. And of course, uh, Peele's Get Out is probably the best known and one of the best uses of gothic tropes and cinematic intertextuality in order to invert the genre conventions and stare directly into the horrors of racism itself. So I want to turn to um, a textual example to kind of round out things uh, that both screams back and engages with the mode of weird fiction. Victor Laval's The Ballad of Black Tom, which is a retelling of Lovecraft's notoriously brutally racist and xenophobic The Horror at Red Hook. And Laval's retelling, set in 1920, uh, 1920s Harlem and Red Hook, Brooklyn, a white occultist recruits Tommy Tester to play music for his party, at which he plans to open an eldritch gate of an unknown horror, um, releasing the sleeping king who Laval insinuates is Cthulhu. However, the day before Tommy is meant to play, his father is brutally murdered by the police. They break in without knocking and mistake his father for a threatening figure holding a gun, although he's only holding a guitar. Tommy experiences a psychological break at this point, at which point the, the novella shifts narrative perspective and narrative voice to the policeman Malone, who is the main character, he's the, the person who tells the story in, in Lovecraft's version of it. <clears throat> 
Through Malone, we see that Tommy Tester has become Black Tom, a direct servant of the evil force the occultist int intended to unleash. Black Tom performs the ritual necessary for freeing the w and waking the sleeping king. He then murders the occultist and the cop who killed his father and mutilates Malone. So he actually cuts his eyelids off so he can never close his eyes, which is obviously a kind of metaphor there. He can't ever be blind again. So six police officers enter the scene and fire 56 shots at Black Tom, but he is unharmed. He returns to Harlem to see his friend one last time, where he confesses that he's kind of set off an apocalypse that, uh, by performing this ritual. He says, quote, that white man was afraid of indifference. Well, now he's going to find out what it's like. In both stories, blackness is equated with monstrosity, but toward very different political ends in terms of representation. Black Tom embraces the destruction of the world as a response to the monstrosity that was written onto him by a racist ontology. Laval thus reframes Lovecraft's iteration of blackness as monstrosity as a response to racial oppression and violence, situating its depictions of cosmic indifference as affectively corollary to, and in fact, less destructive than, white indifference to racial suffering. Like Lovecraft's story, Laval's novella features the screams of a sensitive white man, the Irish cop Malone. So um, Malone's sort of breakdown and screaming is what kicks off uh, Lovecraft's narrative, and then that happens again in, in um, Laval's retelling. But it also features two other sonic eruptions of the supernatural, which I think nicely align with the screams function in both these weird and gothic readings that I'm trying to argue for here. The music Tommy plays at the party is a kind of conjure music that his father teaches him. It's a protective spell to keep him safe. Uh, by contrast, when Black Tom rips a literal hole in the world, he does it with a strange low note that causes dizziness and nausea in many of the people who, who hear it when it happens. Uh, the ritual that frees the sleeping king is also described as a song, as words and music, in which the words are an occult script. So there's something called the, I think it's the ancient alphabet or the sacred alphabet or something like that, that, that. So he has to write the words in blood. But then there's also a kind of musical element, which is this sonic howl that's happening. There's a great wind that's blowing through the, the portal that he's ripped open to the, to the sleeping king. So there's two things operating at the same time. We have something like an occult symbology, but we also have this, this um, uh, unintelligible howl that's happening at the same time. So it kind of serves as a, as a way of thinking about these, these two things operating simultaneously in the same text, the gothic and the weird. So as a kind of conclusion, the gothic offers occult clues and interpretive signs that unlock unspoken or even unspeakable narratives of history and the battles for subjectivity. The weird offers, by contrast, contradictions and re-emergent pasts that disrupt rather than illuminate narratives of human history that infect it with an inhuman as an element both unmanageable and unassimilable. What the weird suggests, then, is not a new hermeneutic tool, but a reorientation toward the text as offering interesting and valuable dislocations and ruptures, rather than meaning or answers or closure. My suggestion for reading and method is that we view horror's ambiguities and failures of mediation as simultaneously a slippery space of contested and possible meaning of hermeneutic possibility and an index of meanings and possibility, which reflects the slipperiness and insufficiency of ontology. The supernatural elements of a text need not always be trans the transcribed, repressed uh, of a social, socio-political unconscious, but may signal rather than signify ruptures in the framework of the real that deconstruct ideological structures from without. Uh, to be sure, this rupture is politically ambiguous, which is why the legacies of weird fiction are rife with reactionary as well as radical thought. Weird reading as a political practice must thus attune to the political conditions of production and reception, particularly to the power dynamics operating in them, and seek out moments of this ontological slipperiness, the porous boundaries in our political ontologies that horror ruptures with its screams. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.